Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Mike Wilson. I'm the Executive Director of AIA East Bay. And we are pleased to present this unique event that gives you a glimpse behind the scenes as well as insight into the, this year's design competition and our judges' point of view on this topic. Excellent reminder, please mute your microphones whenever possible. Um, just so we don't have crinkling in the background. And plus, we don't really want to hear what's going on your side because we've got important messages coming from our judges tonight. So be mindful of your microphone. And with that, please let me introduce to you our moderator this evening, uh, Ursula Curry. She's the AIA East Bay Board Secretary and an architect at Nolan Tam Architects. Ursula? Thank you, Mike. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021st Annual East Bay Design Awards. Thank you so much for joining us on Veterans Day. We really appreciate it sharing this time with you on a holiday. So this pre-event panel discussion, um, we are hosting it, so we wanted to offer you some one-on-one -on -one time with our judges and to give you an opportunity to understand their methodology of selecting the winning entries from so many fantastic submissions. So this year we received almost 70 submissions across eight categories. So please lean in, hear from our panel of judges about their process, the challenges, and the joys of evaluating so many thoughtful and interesting projects, and trying to discern which ones for them were award worthy. So we really welcome questions from the audience, so please Feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them very shortly. So tonight's panel is Janet Town, fellow AIA, she's a principal at Nolan, has been the visiting faculty member at Yale School of Architecture. Her work has been widely exhibited amongst other venues at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, the IFA Gallery in Stuttgart, and at the Venice Biennale. So we're really honored that she was part of the jury as well. So um, I think we should begin with each of the jurors introducing themselves and sharing with the audience one thing they loved about judging design competitions and one thing that they find difficult. So why don't we start with Janet? Janet, would you like to take us away? Oh, great. Thanks, Ursula. Um, I'm Janet Tam. I'm a local architect in Berkeley and have a firm here. Um, our, our work is primarily in the public sector. And I guess um, it's a good question. What um, do we love about judging? For me, I think what I loved about this particular um, panel was that it's really the opportunity to really celebrate our own architectural community, especially here in the East Bay and to present our best work to each other. And, and it's really, in a way, I don't think of it as a, co a competition, but really it's really about sharing our challenges and our ideas with each other. Mm -hmm. And then I think the most difficult thing um, is really acknowledging that judging really starts with kind of a gut feeling that is, is really pretty subjective. And then it has to actually then be translated and articulated in a way that other people can understand and, and, and dis have discourse with you. So mm. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Ursula. Yeah, lovely. David, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thank you. Um... I think for me, uh, the, the the best thing about being on the jury is just having a chance to see uh, things that I wouldn't necessarily normally see in the course of, 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 of practice every day. You know, some really innovative solutions to things, uh, some some new voices uh, emerging out there in the profession, uh, and just a good chance to get ex you know and not get excited about architecture again uh, by seeing some really great great works by, by some folks. And uh, the hardest thing is just you know knowing the you know as an architect knowing that you know, how we all pour our hearts and souls into into these projects. Uh, to not be able to, to recognize everyone uh, uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the work that they're doing. You know, we really appreciate the, the, the great quality of the work that's, that's submitted and, and the efforts that for folks put in on things. Um, and, and we'd love to be able to recognize everyone if possible. Lovely, thank you. Gunnar, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, yeah, no, it's it's wonderful to see the range of work. Um, the lens that I put towards this is coming from a more sustainability perspective, uh, as that's uh, my role at Thornton Tomasetti, and I uh, as I head our group and have the privilege to 
see a whole range of different building types. And so it's really fun to see the, the projects that were put forward um, for this competition and to sort of uh, see, see the, yeah, really the solutions from, you know, solving some challenging problems, projects, uh, problems on existing buildings to creating new opportunities on, on, um, on uh, original sites. Um, and then have the discourse, uh, discourse back and forth with colleagues pushing and pulling on what really what rises to the top. And, and as others have said, you know, how do we um, how do we give awards to everyone? Because everyone's really trying to do the best they can. Sometimes challenged by budgets, uh, timelines, and whatnot, and and just really sort of impressive uh, pieces um, coming forward. So commend everyone for doing such a great great job and. Um, Obviously, we're all trying to push ourselves to do better, and in the in a certainly with what's going on in Glasgow right now and climate change, you know, certainly I think we can all push ourselves more to um, uh, advance our, our architecture um, in in such good ways. Um, so certainly looking for that and continued success by everyone. So. Yeah, you're here. Thank you, Gunnar. Kristen, how about you? What's your perspective? Uh, thank you, Ursula. My favorite part of being on this jury is getting to look at the work and then engage in a conversation about the questions we're all asking as architects and how we address these different things, whether it's uh, urban conditions or sustainability questions or technical details and having a conversation about those things with a really um, enlightened and thoughtful panel. So the conversations that we had were really enjoyable and I think allowed us all to make um, decisions about the awards that were um, surprisingly almost always unanimous. So I think that was really enjoyable to mm -hmm. me. And then for me, the most um, sort of difficult or challenging part of being on a jury is that some of these works, since they're local, um, I've seen, and so I'm going to have a mm -hmm. different sense of being able to evaluate mm -hmm. them versus the ones that might be private or a little further afield in the East Bay that I haven't seen. So I think it was really critical to always like stay in that mindset that I'm um, evaluating these projects based on what the um, architects and their teams have submitted, not based on my experience. So it's sort of a, mm -hmm. a funny way to think about evaluating architecture because we're really evaluating submittals, not the actual mm -hmm. um, experience of the building. Yeah, different senses at play. Pierre Luigi, how about you? Yes, hi everybody. Um, for me, uh, there were a number of lessons that I have learned in this process. Uh, I, I don't, I don't like myself to think of myself as a judge, but more of as an observer because I don't, I don't like the idea of judging my colleagues. But uh, as a consumer of architecture, some of them inhabit space. I obviously respond culturally and, and uh, uh, just on a personal level, and uh, it. There, there, there's consensus uh, among the jurors about certain issues. Uh, it was very um, enlightening to see the, the range of scale that these projects mm -hmm. had, uh, the, the, the range of firms that were involved, uh, uh, firms are, that are long established and newcomers, which is always very good to uh, create new uh, energy uh, in uh, reinforce the established one and bring new ones so for the benefit of architecture so i'm grateful for this experience and i think all of you that submitted um, your projects uh, for this process could you talk a little bit about how you actually went about your process knowing that some of you are not local and some of you are um you know in the bay area just talk a little bit about how you act i mean it's this is our virtual world, you know, so how did you actually pull it off? I can start with this. So like everything else these days, it's on Zoom. So we all um, did our evaluation over Zoom. But what we um, chose to do as a group is that we each wanted to see every single submittal. Often in juries like this, um, each um, each panelist only chooses, only gets to see a selection of them. And we thought it was really critical that we all get to see them. And then mm -hmm. we, through a process of ranking them, sort of winnowed down the selections. And then we met as a group and looked at the ones that sort of rose to the top and um, evaluated them and discussed them. So we made a point of all looking at them and then meeting on Zoom to discuss them. Mm -hmm. 
I think like Pierre Luigi says, the fact that um, your firms are all different sizes and probably the your own portfolio is, is different from the type of work that you're evaluating. So um, I imagine it's, it's quite challenging sometimes to know how to um, evaluate a project, A, that, that you can't see it because as you say, it's just awards. We're not in place having sort of a, um, a visceral experience of it all. Um, so really, did you find sort of new paradigms emerging for yourselves where it's like, oh, you know, maybe I should be designing single family homes or I want to be doing healthcare. This looks really incredible. Did you but find I, new I, things emerge from your own I, experience? I, I would like to, to just add to what uh, Kristen said. Uh, we all saw the projects, uh, uh, the, all the, the submissions. So, so we all had access to all the offerings. And... Uh, um, there are built-in limits in this process. I mean, we look at images, then we look at graphics, and, and uh, architecture is much more than uh, pictures taken by uh, well-paid and uh, highly skilled photographers. So uh, with those limits, uh, we uh, engage into a very, very uh, active discussion of uh, what kind of message we want to send uh, mm -hmm. through the, those that we selected. Uh, I personally can't say that I found uh, uh, something structurally innovative, but I found a reinforcement of certain issues, that the city matters, uh, that uh, there are parts of the city that need to be redeemed, uh, and uh, design is a vehicle to make that happen. Yeah, I could have mm -hmm. more, but I don't want to take time from other mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, I think, yeah, have, there's a, I, for me, in the kind of the, history of the Bay Area in general, and even the, and maybe specifically East Bay, there's a great tradition of buildings and how they engage with the landscape and stuff. And it was really interesting to see how different architects approach that on these different projects of different scales, different types and things like mm -hmm. that. And uh, it was great to see. It was also, it was very interesting to, that, you know, we have a couple of jurors who aren't local and then mm -hmm. some of us that are local. And so some of us, you know, have seen some of these some of these submissions in person and how mm -hmm. that dialogue of you know what you know beyond the images um, but trying to kind of back off from that and just what is the story the architect is trying to tell us through the images and text and judge judge on that was, mm -hmm. was, a, was a good vigorous discussion around that i had a couple of other thoughts too um mm -hmm. i also really enjoyed all of the jury discussions i really learned a lot um i think what was really interesting is just the wide variety of projects it you know I think in the past there you know there was split between residential and other projects and here everything was really mixed together and I think in the end what I realized is that there's a lot of commonality whether it's a single family home mm -hmm. or whether it's um a health care or you know or a civic project that a, a lot of the things that really rose to the top are things that really had a very excelled in in expressing what its purpose was Mm -hmm. And it's larger sort of contribution to um, to the community, to the users, and it, and it's sort of the projects. I mean, it really wasn't a beauty contest, even though we could mm -hmm. say, "Oh, we like this or we don't like that." But it really ended up having very very thoughtful conversations about what was the contribution of this project to mm -hmm. its particular place. Gunnar, mm -hmm. from a sustainability perspective, did you feel? Yeah, this is really rigorous. These people aren't really taking it seriously. This is great. Yeah, it was interesting how some really embraced like, the framework for design excellence and use that mm -hmm. as a criteria for, for putting their submission forward. And so very purposeful about that. And well, and some others. And and I was sort of uh, I think the discourse that then we had wasn't necessarily was was using that at times as as a piece for our conversation. Um, to, to say one had a better sustainability story than others. You know, I, I was certainly looking for that, but it, it triggered some of the discussions we had as a, as a group to evaluate it. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, as, as I like what others have just said here about the range when we look at mm -hmm. the single family to the, the mixed use to, to, to the uh, repurpose of buildings. Um, it was it was a, a really fun, fun discourse. And we were really trying to find those that were Push, pushing boundaries and really, you know, putting forward uh, examples for others to learn from and and for us to sort of, um, yeah, build upon, I guess, as a collective uh, design yeah. design group, yeah. Well, I understand that uh, two new 
categories were created based on the submissions that you saw, historic preservation and the concept on build, um, which emerged due to the trends in the submissions. I understand that that was created. So, and I saw that the maximum number of entries were in the category of single family homes. So does, do you think that provides any insights into trends in our industry that people are more going into the existing fabrics of the buildings that we have and trying to extract, you know, turn them into our modern contemporary architecture as opposed to building new, building new? Well, I, I would jump in and say, yeah, yeah that definitely is a trend because we have to do that. We have mm -hmm. so many existing mm -hmm. buildings from certain eras, certainly that that need to be redone and rebuilt. They weren't built built properly. Um, and, and sometimes because of the density of, of parts uh, you know, of cities that we, we can't just keep sprawling. We have to go back in and fix and redo. And when you start embracing thoughts of embodied carbon um, and the importance mm -hmm. of that, of not just tearing and throwing away, but actually repurposing, I think that's absolutely a trend we're seeing in, in, in architecture and, and a need, a need because of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I would like to say, uh, a couple of words about this aspect uh, uh, and of course I am sensitive to issues of environment uh, but uh, uh, architecture's concern is not just the environment. Uh, the recycling of building brings up issues of typology. If something was uh, 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 an industrial building, how do you turn that into housing? And that uh, as uh, issues of images, issues of plants, issues of uh, uh, civic presence, uh, uh, engaging with the streets. And so those issues to me uh, are uh, uh, important to from, in the context of a design of work. So we, we have some massing that needs to be redeemed and brought back into the city fabric. How did this particular architect, this particular commission dealt with it? And uh, it is clear that the, uh, the reuse, adaptive reuse is a major mm -hmm. component of, uh, of the market uh, and it's a cultural thing. Uh, I mean, in the end, uh, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, Frank Gehry's house was a remodel, right? And mm -hmm. it became an iconic building. And so the remodeling is not inherently uh, uh, a doomed type of uh, uh, architectural effort. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I know you're quite the expert, Pierre-Luigi, in um, really being a voyeur of amazing um, modern century homes you know i know you've got an incredible collection on your instagram account um do you did you see any new trends emerging within from an innovative perspective of materials that were being used in the single family homes or uh well i, I have to say that uh, the, the 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 long shadow of mid-century modern travels deeply into the architectural language uh, mm -hmm. of these uh of these uh, uh, propositions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I am, obviously I'm not the only one, but uh, I, I certainly contribute to that high. But my my entry point was in the level of risk-taking that, mm -hmm. uh, um, that uh, that generation took and the kind of uh, uh, cohesion that there was between the architect, the structural engineer, the contractor, the, the architect, the landscape architect. Uh, and then you have these uh, uh, amazing statements. Uh, now it's uh, it's an active battle. And in many one of the practices at, a, at a, a various levels would encounter some severe roadblocks. So part of them are institutional and part of them are, are dictated by the regulatory process uh, and mm -hmm. also sustainability issues. I mean, in the old days, uh, you know, Crown Zetterbach had only, uh, the restaurant, they had only 20 sheets of, uh, of architecture. Now it's like hundreds of sheets. Mm -hmm. Very cumbersome to do mm -hmm. work uh, that is uh, uh, that is impactful. So competence obviously is one aspect, uh, but then uh, there is issue how, how do you push the, 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 the conversation to the next level? And I have to say, uh, in meeting many of these old timers, uh, they all told me I would never be able to do the work that I did now. I mean, Harry Cole mm. told me that, or Ray Cappy told me that, and mm. many others. Mm. Early on, I mean, we're all alive. So, you know, I might cool. just add. I mm -hmm. think our conversation about adding the category of historic um, uh, buildings was really interesting, and I think we tended to really. Uh, sort of um, fill the, the projects that were um, 
so it didn't damage the integrity of the existing building was really important, but what, but, but what was more, but what made them excel or the winner would excel was the design that really furthered the strength of the building. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just mm -hmm. do nothing to hurt it, but really mm -hmm. how did it really enhance the original idea? And I thought that was sort of an important sort of discussion point that mm -hmm. I learned from, and also the sort of what is a historic building? And mm -hmm. I don't know, Pierre Luigi and Great, David. How you and, create that dialogue between yeah. what was there and, and the, the insertions that you're making. Yeah, and those were the, mm -hmm. the, the best but, of those, those projects. Historic buildings are not those are landmarks to me, because otherwise we have a, a million other buildings that we're missing out. The Brubeck House is not landmarked and it's still mm -hmm. an amazing building. So it's a, recognizing the design merits is part of our expertise right i mean mm -hmm. design is scripted into the building that even if it uh changes uh it's still there in a way i am sort of seeing the the a, a conversation that maybe i mean those are my generation would remember previously that of aldo rossi of architecture in the city that you have a shell and the shell changes over time and it picks up other other uses but it's still the part of the image of the city i think that now that the city is densifying the east bay but i understand that there are projects all, all around uh certainly some of those conversations are, uh, are becoming more and more relevant uh, i have to say maybe what the one uh, piece that uh, and it's a, little, a bit of a realization there's tremendous emphasis on uh, on uh, at least i i have detected it uh, and so I take full responsibility <laughs> about this, but there's tremendous emphasis on the elevations. And I think that this mm. is a bit of a, a byproduct of uh, our overexposure to architectural photography because photographers uh, keep their camera on the X, Z plane. Uh, a lot of the action mm. is on the ground plane. So it's actually a bit more of a, a landscape uh, uh, architecture problem. And when I see landscape architecture, it's more a ground plane problem. So lots of I can I can imagine a lot of illustrator things and moving things and random patterns and panels here and there, but it, it's really about space in the end. And so mm. uh, it can work nicely as a photo image. I mean, as a photograph, but does it work as a space? That's again goes back into the limit. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, we haven't had the opportunity to see these spaces in person, which would be ideal. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because obviously we we know all our teams work in three D modeling. So we're always, you know, with the rim, the Revit and the BIM, we're always looking at it three dimensionally, but maybe well, it's just a presentation material. I just submitted. interviewed uh, for the Monterey Design Conference, uh, Greg Walsh, uh, the partner of Frank Gehry. And uh, it, it felt a bit like a deposition because uh, he's not in great health. So I kept bombarding him with questions, uh, but uh, it states something that is fairly obvious that the, the uh, the real model, the physical model, never fails to tell you the truth uh, of, of the space, whereas the digital model, you can always fake it a little bit. If there's sure. some kind of ambiguity. It looks good, but is it does it really work? So in, in going through his career, especially early on, uh, it became evident that their proposition, again, independent of whether I like them or not, the use of physical models, at a, at a, not at a presentational level, but mm -hmm. the, uh, as the space is happening, it's highly informative to this day. I know it's mm -hmm. hard to build it into the fees, but still. And I think you add in that layer then, how's the building performing? Is it yeah. performing as intended, right? Right. You yeah. can do a model that says this is how it should, but is it actually performing like that from an environmental standpoint and comfort mm -hmm. standpoint? Um, I think that's really, really like, I think valuable as we, as we go forward. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, important to track that. Kristen, is there anything you'd like to add before I take some questions from the audience? Let's hear the audience. Okay, lovely. Yeah. Um, Winston, you have loads of questions here, and I think we should um, unmute Winston and give him the opportunity to ask some of these questions. Yeah, thank you, Ursula, uh, and thank you, panel. Um, I think you've touched on some of this, so I'll, I'll merge some of my questions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned that there were some common issues and conversations that emerged during the jury process. Um, did those kind of give you an impression of uh, this is East Bay design? This is why this is worthy of an award. It's a particularly good example of what we do here in this area. And how might that be different than uh, design you've seen in other areas, particularly if you're not 
a uh, local juror. I'll maybe try to answer a little bit my own opinion. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to quote distinguish between local or regional or, I mean, some of, there are a few international projects, which of course, because of their context was clearly different. And, um, but I thought, you know, the caliber of the work was really fantastic. And, and the variety of the work was really impressive whether it was East Bay or Northern Chapter or Chicago, or, you know, I thought the work was, was, um, was really varied in terms of scale and size. But, and I mean, there were some houses that were more local and regional, you could tell, but um, I don't know. I think there, we have our share of urban infill and challenging projects and, and other projects that are amazing um, educational institutional projects. So I, I don't, and I, and I think they were all, you know, the ones that rose to the top were very sensitive to their particular context, whether it was in the East Bay or whether it was in India. So um, I think, mm. I don't know if that answers your question, Winston, but- Yeah, no, I, I would agree too. I'm, I'm uh, um, based on the East Coast, but certainly, mm. you know, work, work on projects all over the place and, and would agree with, with Jen, yeah, that, that it was a nice representation, nice range and, and uh, uh, kind of fun to see and those outliers were clearly responding to that context appropriately yeah mm, thank you um we've we've one question from brian and i wonder if brian would like to take the mic and ask it and this brian will be Hampton. our last question this will be our last question so we'll keep it brief i i assume you're talking about brian appleton i'm brian appleton it's that's all yours me. that's me well i was just commenting about um trying to repurpose historic buildings and that there are some limitations due to the higher cost of labor now to do the same kind of work that was done maybe a hundred years ago. And I used to live in Washington, DC and in New York City. And I look at some of those Smithsonian buildings with hand carved marble balustrades. And it's just, I used to be in the stone business too. And there's just no way that people can even afford to do some of the things that they used to do. And, yeah. and, and then another comment would be, you know, that I think the material, you know, in Italy, it's everything's made of marble and they have a shortage of wood because the Romans did such a good job of cutting down all the forests to make their fleets and then the goats have kept them from returning. So I used to actually export wood from the US to Italy and, and import mm. marble from Italy to the US. And so in California, you see a lot of use of redwood that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Mm. Things like that, mm. I think, affect how you're going to remodel. Yeah. Supply, and cost of materials. And I would like to, to mm -hmm. just build a little bit of that. Thank you, Brian, for bringing this up. Because obviously, I'm Italian, so I'm, I'm acutely familiar with the reality. Uh, but the issue of, of uh, uh, dealing with the heritage is an issue of also of preserving a certain kind of craftsmanship. Okay, I, I used to live in Rome and uh, I was there for 10 years. There's a whole class of people that make their living exclusively keeping the heritage of uh, the various uh, Vatican City properties alive, like the stucco people. That, that, essentially are keeping alive a tradition that would be dead completely. So uh, while we don't have these conditions in here, when we're dealing with a building that's 100 years old, is even pre-modern, we have an opportunity to keep a, a vestige of that uh, level of excellence, which we do have in the East Bay as well. It's just not, it's not uh, the, the first thought that you have that you um, that comes to mind. In order to do that, you have to first, you as an architect, acknowledge uh, that the building is worthy that uh, extra effort. Mm -hmm. And then a, a, a client that would be willing to invest uh, extra on that and, and, and find a way to make it work uh, as, a, as a lucrative proposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a return on investment. And uh, some of, the, and some of the projects I worked on, mm -hmm. I actually had to import uh, artisans from Italy. Well, it's been always like this since uh, the 1850s. Yeah. <laughs> and, we're, and we're still here. Yes. So I think with that, we should wrap it up. Um, but Brian, thank you so much for your comments. That's a really good observation. And, um, Quite welcome. Thank you.
And panelists, I really appreciate your conversation. I really appreciate your perspectives. And thank you so much for your generous time for bringing these submissions to this event. I really appreciate it.